uh, on this Thursday night. It's great to see you and appreciate the effort you've made to come tonight. And many of you every night or lots of nights, I want to thank uh, the believers at Fifth Ave in a special way for having me. Uh, the Lord said a prophet is without honor in his own hometown, but I feel like the believers in my home province have um, just been very gracious to give me opportunities to serve here. So a very big thank you to you for your support of these meetings. We pray now, uh, and just, just right now, we'll pray that the Lord will bless our time in his word together. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, uh, each one has come in to this meeting tonight with their own kind of day to day. But we thank you that there are things about us and things about you that never change. You are the unchanging father of your people. And the fact that we are your children never changes either. And we thank you that our position and our standing in Christ is unchanging. We thank you that he is the rock of our salvation. And Father, we thank you that we can claim a joy tonight of being justified. Despite the fact that each of us has a lengthy, guilty record of sins, we can stand in joy tonight knowing that we have been justified by the holy God in a decision that will never be reversed. And because of that declaration of righteousness that we've received, we can come boldly into your presence. We can come close to you, Father, and we do so now in our Lord Jesus' name. Father, would you take us all just exactly where we're at tonight? And would you, as we draw near to you, would you draw near to us? Would you meet us in the condition that we're in tonight? Would you speak to our hearts? We know that there's another supernatural being who speaks, Father, and he would try to distract us tonight. He would try to tempt us. He would try to make us doubt your word. And so we pray that your Holy Spirit would prevail through the word of God and would chase out the enemy's lies and would establish us firmly in the truth. We pray that by your power, we would have a greater grasp of the length and breadth and height and depth of the love of Christ for each one of us tonight. Lord, for any might maybe who are here and they're not saved, we pray that you would work in a wonderful way tonight and they would place their faith in Christ, maybe a child. And Father, we pray for every believer here that you will feed and tend and care for and comfort every one of your sheep that listens here tonight. We again pray for those who are sick and struggling, some of them not able to come to the meetings often perhaps. And we pray, O oh Father, that you would care for them and minister to them wherever they are and help them to persevere to the end. And so, Father, we just make these needs known to you. We cannot do what we're about to do apart from your enabling power. So please provide it out of love for us and out of love for your son in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, hopefully every one of you has one of these little Psalm 119 booklets. If you don't, there's a whole box of them in the back chair there, and it'll just help you follow along a little bit. And uh, Jared, if you could pop up um, the passage on, there we are. Uh, so we're, we've been going through this beautiful, lengthy psalm, 22 sections, each section beginning with a different letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And the poet has put himself in this restrictive corner. He says, I'm only going to use that one letter to start all eight verses of this section. Then he goes to the next, the bet section. And tonight we're going to be in the race section, which means that every verse, all eight verses, the leading word begins with the letter race. And, um, and so he's, he's composed this beautiful song. And what is Psalm 119? It's a love song. A love song written about the Bible. A man who is in love with God. And because he loves God, he's absolutely in love with the Bible. And we said on the first night, and we've just touched on it a couple of times since, that we do come across lyrics in this song, which are hard for us to sing honestly. 
because we are not always spiritually where this man was spiritually. We don't always have longings for the Bible like this man. And so what we learned we can do as Christians is to hear our Lord Jesus saying those words. And remember that we are in the Lord Jesus and that we pray in the name of the Lord Jesus. And we can say, what did it mean for my Savior to say those words? And then when we hear him saying those words, it enables us to be able to make a prayer similarly to our God. Well, let's, uh, let's just go through our words. So we're going to be talking tonight about the ups and downs of the normal Christian life. And um, another title I guess we could give this is the Bible is for up and down Christians. But before we get into that, I want to one more time review our words. So this list on the left-hand side is the eight terms that the psalmist uses over and over to describe the Bible. And all the other nights, I only had seven up here. But for the last night, I added the eighth. Thanks to Brother Norman, who encouraged me. I think, to add the word ways at the bottom. But the other seven, you should know already, when we think of the word law, we think Torah, Torah which means teaching. When you come across the word law, you can think, oh, how I love your teaching, your instruction. What about commandments? What do we think of when we see commandments? The commander, which, which communicates what idea, Johnny? Do you remember? A commander conveys authority authority that's right and then rules we don't like this word rules but what are we supposed to think of when we think of when we see this word in psalm 119 rules what do we think of rulings rulings and and so this is god making a judicial decision about you and we're going to talk about this tonight it is absolutely precious we're going to talk about how God the judge comes into the courtroom, as it were, and he looks at you, and he makes a ruling in your favor. And it is good, good news. It is marvelous news. We're going to hear about that tonight. Oh, I did it again. The word, word, you know this already. Uh, it's something that you speak with your mouth, and so this is the spoken word of God. It's not an abstract arms reach far away thing the bible it's a spoken document it comes from god's mouth statutes what's the the mental cue for statutes a statue a statue that's right i remember being well we were in winnipeg airport and my youngest saw the statue of what is it james richardson and she tugged on my sleeve and she said daddy that's an idol. <laughs> but we're not talking about that kind of statue. We're just meaning something that's permanent. Now, I know statues haven't been too permanent the last two years either, but just work with me, okay? <laughs> Normally, when the world is sane, a statue is permanent, okay? And then precepts. Precepts, what do you think of? Precisely right, Norman. Precisely right. And so this is talking about the what of, of the Bible. It's, it's relevance, relevance, step-by-step -step instructions. What about testimonies? Who can remember this one? <laughs> this is an easy one. <laughs> I mean, I don't take away from your answer, Peter, but yes, uh, someone steps into the witness box and they say, I put my hand on the Bible and I swear that I saw I saw, I saw what I saw. That's right. Fred does this. He gives testimony of the truthfulness of God's word. Now, here's the one that we're adding ways. Isn't this a strange one? Often, the Bible is referred to as God's ways. And I like the word trails for this. Because uh, I like remembering being a boy and imagining going down trails the trails of God, and this speaks of the lifestyle. God's word paints a picture of a lifestyle, a kind of life that he wants his people to walk in. All right, now I think, um, I think we're ready to read our verses now. 
And so if you would join me and look at verse 153, which is the Rash section, and we're going to read the last three stanzas of this amazing song. Verse 153, and he says, Look on my affliction and deliver me, for I do not forget your law. Plead my cause and redeem me. Give me life according to your promise. Salvation is far from the wicked, for they do not seek your statutes. Great is your mercy, O Lord. Give me life according to your rules. Many are my persecutors and my adversaries, but I do not swerve from your testimonies. I look at the faithless with disgust because they do not keep your commands. Consider how I love your precepts. Give me life according to your steadfast love. The sum of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. The scene section, verse 161. Princes persecute me without cause, but my heart stands in awe of your words. I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. I hate and abhor falsehood, but I love your law. Seven times a day I praise you for your righteous rules. Great peace have those who love your law. Nothing can make them stumble. I hope for your salvation, O Lord, and I do your commandments. My soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I keep your precepts and testimonies for all my ways are before you. And then the top section. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Give me understanding according to your word. Let my plea come before you. Deliver me according to your word. My lips will pour forth praise, for you teach me your statutes. My tongue will sing of your word, for all your commandments are right. Let your hand be ready to help me, for I have chosen your precepts. I long for your salvation, O Lord, and your law is my delight. Let my soul live and praise you, and let your rules help me. You ready for the last verse of this psalm? 176. I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Seek your servant, for I do not forget your commandments. May the Lord bless his word to us. Well, as I forewarned you, I want to tackle a very difficult theological question tonight. And that is the question, how are you? How are you? How are you supposed to answer that question when people ask it of you? What's the theologically correct answer to the question of how are you? See, if, if we get this wrong, we're in big trouble. A lot of you would know the Hofer brothers, Mark and Derek, and Daniel. And uh, you try asking this to them someday. You know, say, Derek, how are you? Well, the Hofer brothers and me, we used to have a mutual friend who has gone on to glory now. His name is Mr. Webb, Jerry Webb. And if you would have asked him, you know, Mr. Webb, how are you? He would have taken your hand and given you a big smile. And, uh, and he would have said, I'm unbelievably good, you know, unbelievably good. And maybe if he was having a good grammar day, he'd even say, I'm unbelievably well, you know? And, uh, and I think the Hofer brothers latched on to that from Mr. Webb. And they had their own version of what to say when someone asked them, how are you? If you said, Derek, how are you? He might have said, I'm unbelievable, you know? And I say that as a good friend. They wouldn't mind me saying that, right? Just so much energy, so much joy. An expression, I'm unbelievably well. Is that the right answer that a Christian is supposed to give? Is it always to be seven times a day, I praise you, Lord? What is the right answer to the question? What if, uh, what if you don't feel like you're unbelievably well? What if you feel depressed? What if you feel guilty and someone asks you how you're doing and you believe in your mind 
that the only thing a Christian is supposed to say is, seven times a day I praise you, Lord, and, uh, and I'm on top of my spiritual game, and everything's going well. I'm experiencing total victory in every aspect of my Christian life. Is that what the ideal Christian is supposed to be able to always say? Well, you know, if, if you ask Derek and Daniel and Mark at other times how they're doing, they won't say I'm unbelievably well, right? Any of you who know them, probably you've had times where you've asked them, and they've said, I'm struggling. I'm sad. I'm discouraged. I'm worried about my family situation. Because they're real. They're, they're honest with us, right? And, um, and so are they more pleasing to the Lord on the times when they can say I'm unbelievably well? And then the other times when they're saying, I feel attacked, I feel oppressed, I'm discouraged. Are they less pleasing to the Lord on those days? What is the correct answer? What are Christians supposed to say? Are we always way up here or are we somewhere in the middle? You know, not too hot, not too cold, not too up, not too down. We're just always right here in the middle. What are we supposed to say? Well, J.I. Packer, he wrote a book called Knowing God, which I have found so helpful. And the second last chapter in that book is called this. It's called These Inward Trials. I highly, highly recommend it. And Mr. Packer, he says there's a kind of, of gospel ministry that is cruel. It's cruel. It doesn't try to be cruel. It means to be helpful. It means to be encouraging and good. But it's cruel because what it does is it teaches Christians to think that the Christian, the normal Christian life is different from what the Bible says the normal Christian life is. It, it's a type of ministry that is well-meaning, but it, it maybe just overemphasizes the wrong things a wee little bit. It is so excited to celebrate the wonders of salvation and the wonders of what God has done for all who trust in him, that, that it, it really wants to emphasize the change that takes place at conversion and how your sins are forgiven and how the Holy Spirit comes in and how God becomes your father. And all of a sudden you get a new power and a new joy and, and you experience victory in ways that you never could experience before. And, and, and you, you feel like you're just a brand new person, right? And you're so joyful, you're so happy. But the problem is, is that if that's all you emphasize, then you're not describing the normal Christian life. Because you're not emphasizing the fact that the normal Christian life has a rough side to it. The daily chastening, Packer says, the endless war with sin and Satan, the periodic walk in darkness. And it gives the impression that normal Christian living is a perfect bed of roses in which everything is lovely all the time and no problems exist. Or if problems do come, you simply zip to the throne of grace and they melt away instantly and you carry on in a state of endless victory and so on. And so, and so there's such an emphasis on the change that Christians misunderstand what's normal about the Christian life. And we think, we think that joy I had in the first two weeks of being a Christian, that's what's normal. That's what's normal. And anything less than that means I failed. Means I'm wrong. I, I must have done something wrong. You know, we think that joy when I first got saved, that's the starting point now. And every day it should be getting better and better and better and better. And if it isn't, then I must have done something wrong. And so we think, well, I got to get back. You know, I was up there and now I'm down here. Somehow I got to get back. And so we say, well, the problem must be me. And so what do I need to do? Reconsecrate myself to the Lord. Clearly, my commitment has waned. Clearly, I'm not as devoted anymore. And listen, sometimes a lack of joy in the Christian's life is because we've sinned. But God doesn't play hide and seek with us. You'll know if it's sin, right? You just, Lord, is there, is, have I missed something? Like, and normally we would know 
yeah, there's a pretty obvious thing. And I know in my heart, I've been rebelling against his clear word in a fairly major way. And I simply need to repent and come back to him. But listen, there's much up and down in the Christian life that is not tied to the Christian's failure in sin. And if, if we get into one of these patches where our Father has intended for us to go through a bit of roughness, and all we can think of is that this whole experience in my life is owing to some sin in my life, and so then we turn inward and we keep trying to find something that isn't there. We keep trying to find the source of the problem in us when it's not in us. The, the presence of these afflictions in your life is not meant to you to dig up sin that isn't there. It's actually meant to assure you that you are the Father's. It's actually meant to be a strange sense of comfort to you that says, yes, this is normal for the Christian. This is an evidence that I am his. I am undergoing trials and chastening, which are an evidence of the normal Christian life. And so our father, he loves us too much to leave us in our infancy. We, we don't want our children to um, just stay as a six-month-old. We want them to grow and grow and grow, and so does our Father. He loves it when we get saved and we're newborns and we experience these joys that we never had before, but eventually he wants to put us through rougher waters so that we'll mature and grow and, and become more of the Christians we're meant to be. So the normal Christian life, brothers and sisters, is full of ups and downs, and, and that creates the freedom when we're asked, how are you doing? It creates the freedom to be honest. And sometimes to be able to say, I'm very happy, thank you. But other times to be able to say, I'm struggling. I'm not feeling very thankful. I feel like he's withdrawn from me. I feel like he hasn't spoken to me for a long time. And that's normal too. That's part of the normal Christian life. So let's, let's find this in the text, or let's see this in the text. We've got three stanzas here that we're finishing up. And the first one in the race section, this is what the Psalm 119 believer is saying. If, if you would have come up to him and said, Mr. Psalm 119 believer, how are you doing today? Well, in the race section, he would have said, I'm accused, but secure. I'm accused, but secure. And then you turn the page over into the scene section. And you say, Mr. Psalm 119 believer, how are you doing today? He says, well, today I'm attacked, but I'm rejoicing. I'm happy today. Very happy. And then you come to the final Tav section. And you say, Mr. Psalm 119 believer, how are you doing today? And he would say, you know what? I'm astray, but I'm found. First one, I'm accused, but secure. Second one. I'm attacked, but rejoicing. Third one, I've gone astray, but I'm found. The first one, if you would have said, can you pick a song that would express what you're feeling today in the race section? He would have said, I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. And then the next day for the, the, uh, the scene section, he would have started singing, you know, um, I'm so happy, and here's the reason why Jesus took my burden all away. Why, are you, why aren't you happy, he might have said to you. And then on the final one, the very last section of the psalm, if you say, well, what, what, psalm, describes, what, what psalm describes where you're at? He might have said, you know those, uh, those really slow, sad songs that the young people don't like? You know... I'm only a pilgrim and a stranger here, you know, going through this wide wilderness, drear and all this. He says, that's how I feel today. I've, I've gone astray, but I'm found. So let's go through them. Raish section, first of all, I'm accused, but secure. So look at verse 153. He's afflicted, right? Look on my affliction. We get a hint of what is the source of the affliction. In verse 157, he says, many are my persecutors and my adversaries. In other words, there's people speaking against him. 
And then we get another hint in verse 154. Look at it. He says to God, he says, God, plead my cause and redeem me. Well, this is lawyer language. He's saying, God, I need some legal aid. I need, I'm being attacked. I'm being accused of things. And I'm asking you to be my advocate. I'm asking you to come and stand and speak for me and plead my cause and get me out of this predicament that I'm in. And then maybe verse 160 just gives us a teensy bit more of a hint. He says, the sum of your word is truth and every one of your righteous rules endures forever. Remember what the word rules means? It means God's judicial decisions the things he decides in your favor as your judge. And he says, every one of your righteous rules uh, endures forever. So, So here's where he's at in the race section. He says, I'm attacked, I'm accused, but I'm secure. The enemy is attacking me. The accuser of the brethren, Satan, he's, he's bringing his charges against me. And Lord, plead my cause. Be my legal aid, be my advocate, and speak up for me. And in verse 160, he says, The sum of your word is truth, the leading edge, the most prominent, topmost characteristic of your word, O God, is that it is truth. It is truth. And every one of your righteous judgments, every one of your legal decisions endures forever. Well, I love how Christopher Ash speaks of this. I told you last night that I am indebted to him um, for much of my handling of Psalm 119. And this is how Christopher Ash speaks about this. It's like, it's like Satan comes in to God's courtroom with a great big bulging briefcase. And he tries to get an audience with God. And he says, God... I see you've made a decision about brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. I see you've made a judicial decision in their favor. And I just want to humbly suggest that you're wrong in making that decision. You have declared that person to be righteous. But I've got a great big file here full of evidence that they are not righteous. I've been working hard documenting all their deeds and all their thoughts and all their desires. And it's all here. And he sprawls it out in front of God. There's the evidence. You've made the wrong decision, God, about brother so-and-so. And And you know, how would God respond? God could respond this way. He could say, actually, accuser of the brethren, you've missed a few things. I've got a bigger file than you do. But Mr. Satan, what have you dug up against my son? What have you got against my son? And Satan turns and slinks away because he's got nothing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, When God justified you, when you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and God said, I'm not going to wait for the final day of judgment to say my verdict over this person. I see that she is trusted in Jesus Christ, and I'm going to move that right here, right to the present. And right now, I'm going to give my verdict. I'm going to bestow my verdict over this person and declare her to be righteous forever righteous in my sight. You see, when God makes those judicial decisions for you, that decision, that once and for all decision to declare you righteous, when he does that, he does it righteously. There is no soft spots in his judicial decision. It's the sum of your word is truth and every one of your righteous rulings endures forever. It is full of integrity. It withstands all scrutiny. Nobody can find anything wrong with it. Why? Because when God made his decision to declare you righteous, he didn't base it on you. He didn't base it on whether you're up or whether you're down. He didn't base it on whether your feelings are happy or sad, clean or guilty. 
He didn't base it on your deeds or your track record, but he based it entirely upon his righteous, holy, innocent, Bible-loving, Bible-obeying, Bible-following son. So that the case against you and me goes away because of the case for Christ. Everyone of your righteous rulings endures forever. And so, brothers and sisters, this is how we live our life. How are you today, dear Christian? I'm accused, but I'm safe. I'm accused, but I'm secure. I can hear the attacks. I can hear the sinister words. I can hear all my sins being drudged up and all the dirt being brought out to this way. I can hear it all. I can hear the accuser attacking me, but I know I'm secure. Why? Because God made a decision about me and he didn't base it on how I'm feeling and he didn't base it on how I'm doing, but he based it on the perfect, righteous Jesus Christ. I've shared with some of you before that the fall before COVID came, and for quite some time after, I struggled with what seemed to be endless guilt. And I took so much comfort from knowing that this is part of the normal Christian life. So that I didn't need to hide it. I didn't need to pretend that it wasn't there. I didn't need to pretend I was happier than I was. I could be honest primarily with God. Primarily with God, I could be honest, but also with his people. Because, because I know that I'm under accusation, but, but I'm safe. So here's just a moment to take, to take a moment and talk about the difference between our standing and our state. Do all of you kids and teens and 20-year-olds, do you know the difference between your standing and your state? Your standing is your position in Christ. And it cannot change, cannot change. Um, things like this, that you're righteous in his sight. It can't change. No matter what you do tonight, that can't change. It's, it's unchangeable. God has made a decision to declare you righteous, and it can't be undone. It's true of you. That's your standing. That's your position in Christ. What else is true of you positionally? as to your standing in Christ. It's true of you that you are a saint, even when you don't act very saintly. It's true of you that you're his child, even though you don't act very much like his child. It's still true, because that's your standing. And now our state can be up and down all the time, right? We, we can be um, compromising, and in the very act of compromising, and yet nothing has changed with our position in Christ. So that's a, a wonderful thing to get a hold of. But let's move on to the second one, because the next day we run into Mr. Psalm 119, believer in the grocery store, and we say, how are you doing today? And he says, oh, I'm attacked, sure, but I'm rejoicing. I'm so happy. I'm having a wonderful day. So just turn your page over and see this in the passage, just briefly. This is the happiest part of the whole psalm. Last night, last night when we came to the middle of Psalm 119, we were in the, the midnight hour of the psalm, the lowest point. It was low. But here we are. This is the happiest section of the psalm. And, I mean, he does have a problem. Look at verse 161. I mean, there's princes persecuting him without cause. But everything else in this section is happy, happy, happy. Verse 162, I rejoice at your word like one who finds great spoil. Verse 163, I love your law. Seven times a day, I praise you. He's singing, singing, singing. 165, oh, great peace. I'm feeling wonderful peace in my heart today. And then uh, 167, uh, my soul keeps your testimonies. I love them exceedingly. I just love obeying God. And, um, and then 168, he's enjoying the privilege of the Christian of living his life before the face of God before the shining eyes of God. So he's doing great. You ask him, how are you doing? I'm happy. I'm unbelievable, unbelievably well today. Attacked, but rejoicing. Victory. 
He's like Paul, he says, I'm sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Just before we move on, because I really want to come to the last section of the psalm, uh, just let's linger for a moment on verse 162. I rejoiced at your word like one who finds great spoil. How did he get into this place of such joy where he experiences the Bible as spoil? You know what the word spoil means, kids? When there's a big fight, when there's a big battle, you're really scared that you're going to die. And you're really scared that the other army is going to win and conquer you and take away all your toys, right? But then you survive. And you don't only survive, but you thrive. You beat them and they run and fly away and you call them a bunch of nasty names. And then you get all their toys. You get all their goodies, all their food and their candies. And, and I mean, more important things than that too, right? Their horses and stuff, spoils. And, and see, the point is, once again, this is just to repeat what we said on night two, that, that we only experience the Bible as joy, as spoil, as treasure when we've been through the battle. In other words, God uses affliction to make us into Bible Christians. But let's come, let's come to the final section, the Tav section. And so first, our Christian, he said, yeah, I'm accused, but I'm secure. And then he said, I'm attacked, but I'm rejoicing. And now in the top section, he says, you know what? I'm astray, but I'm found. Look at verse 169. He's crying again. He's just had the happiest day of his life, Right? Joy all over his face, singing away. What could possibly assail me now? You know, I'm having a great day in my Christian life. And you turn one page over, and what's he doing? Songs are gone. Smile is not nearly as beaming as it was. What's he doing? He's crying again. Let my cry come before you, O Lord. Verse 170. Let my plea come before you, O Lord. Deliver me. He says in verse 171 and 172 what he will do if God answers his prayer. He says, God, if you get me out of this dark hole I'm in, if you, if you just shine your face upon me again, and you listen to me and you help me out of this, I'll praise you like I did yesterday again. I'll be happy again for you. I'll be praising you again, but you got to get me out of this. He says, verse 173, let your hand be ready to help me. Oh, 174, I long for your salvation, Lord. Just let me live, 175, and praise you. And then 176, it is such a shocking verse. Because all the way through Psalm 119, this believer has been singing love songs to the Bible, talking about how he's going to keep God's word with all his heart talking about how he wakes up and sets his alarm for the middle of the night so he can wake up and praise God for giving him the Bible and how he's going to keep it forever and ever. And he says in the last verse of this magnificent song, he says, I have gone astray like a lost sheep. Alec Matir calls this the wandering sheep's charter. The wandering sheep's charter. You know what? What we're looking at here is the normal Christian life. Ups and downs. Victory and failure. Obedience. And then we fall. And we go astray. This is part of Christian living. And he, he says... He says, Father, seek your servant. You know, I'm, I'm a lost sheep. I've gone astray. So be like a shepherd to me and seek your servant. Now, listen, this verse is so amazing at multiple levels. Let, let's look at just one other thing that makes it amazing. Just look at the verse itself. He says, I've gone astray like a lost sheep. Be a shepherd to me and come and find me and get me out of this muck of sin that I've fallen into. Why? because I do not forget your commandments. You see, this man 
is putting things together in the same verse that we don't think fit together. Do you, do you hear what he's saying? He's saying, Father, be a shepherd and come and find me because I've broken your word. And, and find me and restore me because I don't forget your word. He's saying, restore me for breaking your word because I never forget your word. You see, this is the, the tension in the Christian life. This is what happens in the Christian life. It, it is such a powerful description. When I read this verse, I can't help but think of my college days. And I, the struggle with sin was so strong. And I would sin and I would fall over and over and over again. But I would never forget his word. I would sit in ministry. They'd have meetings at, at, uh, in Winnipeg, you know, and, and a preacher would come and he'd preach. And I think, whoa, this ministry is so powerful. The presence of God is so strong. I can't see myself ever doing that sin again. And then 24 hours later, I'm back in the muck. I'm like, did that ministry not do anything to me? Is his word not powerful after all to deliver? But you know what? I kept coming back because of his word. I broke his word, but I never forgot his word. Because I have such a good rememberer, as John Fitzpatrick would call it, such a good rememberer? No, because this, when I was six years old, and God granted me to trust in his son. The Holy Spirit did something special in my heart. Do you know what it was? He took God's word and he inscribed it in my heart. And he did the same for you if you're a believer. The moment you got saved, just read Hebrews chapter 8. He put his words into your mind and he put it into your heart so that when you sin and when you fall, and when you disobey and you break God's word, you never, never, never forget it. So Tim Challies talks about this. I think he um, reworked something maybe by F.B. Meyer. I'm not sure. But he made up sort of a story like this. He says, one day I met a farmer. And we sat down together and the farmer told me a story. He said, one day I noticed that one of my sheep and one of my pigs went missing. And I searched around to find how they got out. And sure enough, there was the hole in the fence. And they both went out together. And so then I tried to follow the trail. And I searched and searched and searched all day. But I couldn't find the sheep and I couldn't find the pig. So finally, I went back to bed and had a restless night of sleep. And as soon as I could, I got up the next day. And I continued my search. And he searched and he searched and searched until finally he heard something. A pig snorting? No. What did he hear? The sheep. The sheep was bleeding. And he followed the sound of the sheep bleeding. And he came to this big old nasty bog. And there was the sheep. And there was the pig. They were both in the same bog. They were both covered in muck. They were both unable to come out. But the pig was having the time of its life. Here's the point. It was only the sheep that bleated. Be the sheep said the farmer, be the sheep. The cow, the sow, sow doesn't cry when it sins. You, 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 I'm just pressing the analogy now, right? The unbeliever doesn't cry when he sins. And I, I don't mean, you know what I'm saying. But what does the Christian do? What does the sheep do when she sins? She bleats, says, Lord, Lord, I've gone astray. Like a lost sheep, I've gone astray. Come get me, Lord. Come find me. Come clean me up and haul me out of here and put me back on dry ground because she is a sheep. And so the farmer said, if you are ever deceived into a sin and overtaken by a weakness, don't lose heart. Go at once to your compassionate Savior. Tell him in the simplest words the story of your fall and the sorrow you feel. Ask him to wash you at once and to restore your soul. And while you're asking, believe that it is done. For if a sheep and a sow fall into a ditch, the sow wallows in it, but the sheep bleats pathetically until she is cleansed by her, her master. Be the sheep, my friend. 
and not the pig. This is the wandering sheep's charter. Be the sheep when you sin. 1 John 1, 7. Let us confess our sins because he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. Let me just quickly touch on one thing before I close, and that is I have mentioned that I believe the Lord Jesus prayed all these psalms, including Psalm 119. And we come to this last verse, and we touch on this another night, but does this, does this last verse mean that we can't enjoy hearing our Savior pray the psalm? Because it's got a verse about sinning in it. And all I will say is, the new, it didn't stop the New Testament writers from looking at other psalms, like Psalm 69, and saying, we can hear Jesus praying this psalm, even though that psalm had verses in it about them sinning. And let me, let me just do this, okay? What would the Lord Jesus have done as he was praying through Psalm 119 and he came to this last verse? What would he have done? You, th- you say, well, maybe, maybe he just skipped that verse. Very possible. Very possible. What would he have thought? What would he have thought? If you're not comfortable with him actually saying these words, what would he have thought? He would have thought this. Fathers, I come to this last verse. You know that I've never gone astray, Father. I am sinless. I've never gone astray. But Father, you know that my whole reason for coming was to be the lamb who would take the place of the sheep who can say this verse. And I identify with them. I identify with them so much that I'm willing to be made sin for them. I identify with them so much that I'm willing to become a curse for them. I identify with them so much that I'm willing to be treated like the strange sheep and have all their wrath and judgment fall upon me so that when they bleat, you can look on me and see that their punishment has already been served on one who never strayed. You see, the Lord Jesus is the Lamb of God who became the shepherd who became a sheep so that he could take the place of a strange sheep so that we, so that we can always be honest when God asks us how we are or when another believer asks us how we are. We can always be honest, even if it means we have to say, I have gone astray like a lost sheep, but I'm found. I'm found in Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, in answer to the question, how are we doing? How are you doing? The the answer simply is we can be honest. If you're joyful, you can say, "I'm, I'm having a great day. But if you're not, you can be honest then too. Why? Number one, because you believe with all your heart that it's normal for Christians to have up and down days, right? We take away the stigma entirely. This psalm, the last three stanzas, the third last one is fairly good. The second one is really, really happy. And the last one is way down. He's committed a sin. This is part of the the normal Christian life to have ups and downs. And then the second reason we can be honest is because we are in Christ. We are positionally in him. Do you know why? Do you know why the Father wants us to go through struggle sections in our life? Do you know why he wants us to have slip-ups and to go over bumps and to go through times where it's dark and we're fearful and we're struggling? Do you know why? If you were walking down the road and it was bright and it was clear and nicely paved asphalt and not a worry upon you, and someone came along and offered you their arm and said, here, let me help you. What would you do? I don't need you, right? But it's when you come to a place where there's a raging stream that's cut across and someone big and strong is able to come to you and say, let me help you across this. That's when we take the arm. And so what does the father do? He says, I'd like them to take my son's arm. I'd like them to learn to lean upon him. And so what will I do? I will see to it that as part of their life, as part of their development, they go through times which are up and then down, great and then difficult, so that when my son offers his arm, they'll take it because they sense 
And let's let's actually finish. I am going to finish with this by this wonderful poem by John Newton. I know that sometimes our mind can go when poetry is read, but it's called These Inward Trials, and I'll finish with this. He says, I ask the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace, might more of his salvation know and seek more earnestly his face. I hoped that in some favored hour, at once he'd answer my request and by his love's constraining power, subdue my sins and give me rest. Instead of this, he made me feel the hidden evils of my heart and let the angry powers of hell assault my soul in every part. Yea, more, and with his own hand he seemed intent to aggravate my woe, crossed all the fair designs I schemed, blasted my gourds and laid me low. Lord, why is this? I trembling cried. Wilt thou pursue thy worm to death? Tis in this way, the Lord replied. I answer prayer for grace and faith. He says, these inward trials I employ from self and pride to set thee free and break thy schemes of earthly joy that thou mayest seek thy all in me. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this great psalm, Psalm 119. And we thank you for the great book, the Bible, that the whole psalm is about. Father, we thank you that it teaches us that there's a normalcy in the Christian life to having ups and downs, to having bad days and good days. We pray that this would bring us tremendous comfort and that we would not labor under the illusion that the normal Christian life is 100% sheer joy and victory, but that rather it includes many struggles, many times when we have to confess we're wrong, many times when we have to bleat like straying sheep. Father, we're so thankful that the Lord Jesus is our shepherd and that no one can pluck us out of his hand nor out of your hand. And uh, Father, just help each one of us through the inward trials that you employ to make us seek our all in Christ. Father, do bless each bowed head here tonight and minister to our hearts in a wonderful way. Encourage those, Lord, who are really, really struggling. And we pray that in Christ and in your people and in your word, they would discover the help and strength they need to carry on. We pray this in the Lord Jesus' name. Amen.